Good afternoon. My name is Carla Fields. I am the Outreach Specialist at the Alzheimer's Association of Northern California, Nevada, and I focus on outreach to the African American community. You are viewing Black women and dementia, two sides of the story. Thank you for joining us today. Um, first of all, I'd like to go over some quick health rules. Everyone is muted upon entry. We will be using the question and answer format for any questions that you would like to have our panelists answer during the question and answer section at the end of our session. So please stay tuned, but as your questions come up, feel free to put them in the Q&A section. Also, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors of our program. I'd like to recognize Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Rho Delta Omega Chapter. I'd like to recognize Capital City Black Nurses Association and Bay Area Black Nurses Association. All three have been sponsors of our program today. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over. I'd like to ask one of our board members, Valerie Toller, to say a few words of welcome. Thank you. Valerie? Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Valerie Toller, and I am a member, a board member. It's my second year of the California Alzheimer's North, of Northern California. I also serve as an advocate for Alzheimer's. I came to this because of my father, Burl A. Toller Sr., who had Alzheimer's and I was his caregiver for, for two years. He passed away in 2009. Um, I welcome any questions and thank you for being here today. All right, well next, I would like to invite Vicki Stevens from the AKA chapters to say a few words. Good afternoon. I am Vicki Stevens, a proud 40 year member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Rodelta Omega Chapter, Palo Alto, California. RDO, also known as the AKAs of Palo Alto, recognize the necessity of partnerships and collaborations for successful community outcomes. The Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated is composed of 300,000 college-educated women worldwide. We include in that number Madam Vice President of the United States of America, Kamala Harris. <laughs> Exemplifying excellence through sustainable service is our program theme. Target two, which is women's health care and wellness is designed to raise community awareness of critical health issues impacting African-American women. So we, Rho Delta Omega, is proud to have presented a program during National Caregivers Month. Thank you, Carla Fields, for serving as one of our panelists. RDO volunteers with the Alzheimer's Association, Association in areas of advocacy and a longtime supporter of The Longest Day. As for me, I am the granddaughter of a Black woman who suffered with dementia for the last 10 years of her life. I am a caregiver of a parent who suffers from dementia, currently residing in a long-term care facility. I am the daughter of a woman who watched her husband endure the mental anguish, pain, and ultimately the premature death from complications of dementia. So today, on this magnificent day, before my 60th birthday, I bring greetings on behalf of my president, Zena Slaughter, and all the members of Rho Delta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha. Thank you, Carla Fields, for this forum, and special thanks for our moderator and all panelists and attendees. Well, thank you very much, Vicki, and happy birthday to you. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Sheree Kreiner from the Capital City Black Nurses Association. Sheree? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheree Kreiner. I'm the Vice President of the Capital City Black Nurses Association, which is a local chapter of the National Black Nurses Association. We serve <clears throat> in Sacramento. <throat> yep. 
And I'd like to thank everyone for this opportunity. Uh, one of the tenets of Capital City Black Nurses is to partner with community programs so that we can meet and fill in the gap when it comes to health inequity. Um, dementia is near and dear to my heart. Um, I took care of my grandmother for many years as she suffered from dementia. And as a nurse, I've also seen the uh, stigma around dementia and how people interact with, patients with dementia, specifically uh, black women. So I'm honored to be here. And on behalf of myself and the rest of my board and our president Carter Todd, Capital City Black Nurses Association, uh, thank you for putting on this program. And I'm excited to be a part of any future collaborations. Thank you so much. Sheree, we value all of our partnerships because without our partnerships, we cannot do the work that we do and fulfill our mission to reach all communities and all, all um, areas of all communities. So we value all the partnerships and we look forward to continuing to work with all of our community partners. I'm going to um, turn it over to our moderator who I would like to introduce, Terry Carlisle. Terry Carlisle has been a very valued volunteer here at the Alzheimer's Association. She is a finance and operations manager at the Urban Strategies Council. In this role, she handles all areas of accounting ranging from accounts receivable and payables to grant management and financial statement preparation and acts as a liaison with the Fiscal Sponsor Partnership. Terry has over 30, I'm sorry, 20 years of experience working in the nonprofit sector prior to joining Urban Strategies Council. She was an independent contractor working for various nonprofit organizations throughout the Bay Area. Terry obtained her Bachelor of Science degree from Cal State University Hayward. She is a member of the Black Alzheimer's Association Advisory Council and a true value volunteer Terry enjoys planning community conversations for the African-American community. In her spare time, Terry gives back to the communities that she loves, whether that's distributing tents, hygiene kits, or meals to the homeless, or delivering groceries to the senior citizens and families suffering from food insecurity. Terry lives by the motto, it is a blessing to be a blessing. And we do feel blessed by her participation. I'm going to turn it over to Terry Thank you so much for Terry, your role today. And thank you to our sponsors who allow us to do what we do for the community. Terry, welcome aboard today. Thank you, thank you, Carla. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. As Carla said, my name is Terry Carlisle and I have been involved with the Alzheimer's Association for approximately two and a half to three years. I got involved with the organization because my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and when she was diagnosed, I didn't know much about the disease, even though we had a few people in our family who had it. So once I saw her with the disease, I was like, wait, this is something that I don't even understand. So let me try to get involved. Let me try to learn some things. So I started attending the African-American forums and that's when I learned that black women were the number one carriers of the disease. And once I learned that, I was like, what? Oh no, oh no, I gotta scream this from the rooftops and let everybody know that, hey y'all, we are the number one carriers. So we need to be on the lookout and we need to learn all that we can. And ever since then, I've been all in. And since my grandmother was diagnosed, my father was actually di diagnosed with mild dementia, mild dementia, I'm claiming that it stays mild dementia. And so now I'm all in, wherever I can serve, I'm excited to serve. And so today I'm over excited because we are gonna have an hour of power with black girl magic, talking about black women and dementia, two sides to every story. I know y'all heard the saying, there's two sides to every story and then there's the truth. Well, today we will hear the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us God. And we, so let me introduce our panelists, ladies. I'm gonna unfortunately have to read it word for word because I do not wanna miss one part of this because these sisters are bad. They have every initial in the alphabet behind their names and I wanna make sure that I get it all in. So first up, we will be joined by Miss Tina Thomas. Miss Tina Thomas has an MSHP, a CDP, a CADDCT and a CMHS. 
I don't know what any of those are, but I know it means that this sister knows what she's talking about. Tina Thomas is the Senior Director of Programs and Services for the Greater Richmond, Richmond VA and the Central and Western Virginia chapters of the Alzheimer's Association. Tina holds a Bachelor of Science in Healthcare Administration and a Master's of Science in Hospice and Palliative Studies. She holds postgraduate certifications in gerontology, addiction specialist, pastoral care, nursing home administration, and Alzheimer's disease and dementia care. Tina is also a Dementia Friends Champion and a Rosalind Carter, Carter Institute dealing with dementia facilitator. Prior to joining the Alzheimer's Association, Tina worked as a home health and hospice administrator and a dementia education specialist. Give her two snaps, give her two snaps, y'all. Our next panelist is Dr. Fawn Gotham. Now, when I read Dr. Fawn, I said, okay, okay, mama, go, go, go. So Dr. Fawn, not only did she say, I'm gonna be a nurse, she was like, I'm gonna be a doctor and a nurse. So she holds a PhD, RN, GCNS, BC, FGSA. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Dr. Gotham is an associate professor at the Family Caregiving Institute at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at University of California, Davis. Her research focuses on health equity and the health of African-American dementia family caregivers, specifically caregiving stress and resilience. And if you have a family member with Alzheimer's, you know that it can be very stressful. She is a member of the inaugural cohort of Betty Irene Moore Fellow for Nurse Leaders and Innovators. She's also a distinguished educator in gerontological nursing. Uh, Gotham is also a UC Davis Center for the Advancement of Multicultural Perspectives on Science, otherwise known as Campo Scholar. She's a consultant with the UC Davis Alzheimer's Disease Center Outreach and Recruitment Corps and a former Claire Fagan postdoctoral fellow with the National Hartford Centers of Gerontological Nursing Experience. Prior to her appointment at UC Davis, she was an assistant professor at Rush University College of Nursing in Chicago. Dr. Gotham earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Howard University in DC, give it up for HBCU. She completed a Master of Science in Nursing with an emphasis in gerontological nursing and a doctor of philosophy in nursing, both from the University of Michigan and Arbor. I want y'all to give it up for our two speakers. Give it up, give it up. So we are going to be, we, this is a panel discussion. Remember, if you have a question, put it either in the Q&A, put it in the Q&A or put it in a chat, but preferably the Q&A. We're gonna to get to the questions at the end and Please make sure that everybody is on mute, on mute. And so now we're gonna go ahead and just jump right in. You ladies ready? Carrie, so this first question is for the both. Carrie, this is Carla. I just wanted to yes. let our audience, yes. audience know that Dr. Tavares was originally scheduled to join us, but because of illness, she was no longer able to join us. So Tina Thomas, our, our expert on all things dementia, has stepped into her place. And we really wanna thank Tina and wish Dr. Tavares the best that she will be back well, feeling well as soon as possible. Please go ahead and continue, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. So right before we even get started, let's just pause and take like a 30, like a 10 second inhale, exhale. Cause one thing I noticed is that if we didn't automatically breathe we would probably forget to stop and breathe. So let's just we'll saw real quick and then we'll go, you know, inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Y'all know I just do that for myself because I'm just overexcited about the day, right? <laughs> I just had to do that for myself. So we're going to jump right in. This question is for both of you. We're going to start with Miss Tina Thomas. Why don't you give us, tell us a little bit about your work and how do you see Black women being impacted by dementia? Thank you so much, Terry, and thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, and I certainly want to thank Carla for putting on this uh, terrific presentation. I also want to say to Vicki Stevens, um, we could feel your joy and yes. the fact that you are so proud of Madam Vice President coming through. So thank you so very much for that enthusiasm. 
Um, Terry, I have been working in this space now for a th little bit over 30 years, su supporting older adults. Um, it's the easiest thing in the world for me to do is get up and provide care in this space. It's easier for me to do what I do at work than it is for me to do what I need to do at home. So um, I, it's it's a gifting and I, I, I take it as an opportunity to provide service um, and care back to folks in the community. Um, that, so that, that's, that's who I am. That's what I bring to the table. And I bring that with a level of joy and enthusiasm and still a certain level of curiosity. I love that. I love that. And so how, how, how do you see that dementia is impacting Black women? You know, Black women are the, are the heart of this epidemic. You know, we are the heartbeat in our communities. Black women are seeing this on all spectrums. And I think we heard that in some of the introductions. They work in industries that provide care for people who are impacted by this disease. They then support people in their communities, their churches, in their neighborhoods, and their families who are impacted by this disease. And then Black African Americans are two times more likely to be impacted by this disease. And women are two thirds more likely to be impacted than men, which means Women are the greatest at risk for developing this disease. Um, and there are a lot of factors, and we're gonna be talking about that as we move throughout the day, that it talks specifically about why we are so disproportionately impacted. But women, the, the darts are coming at this on all sides as it relates to this disease and this disorder. Um, and I think there's a lot more awareness that needs to happen yes. because I, I don't know that black women, just like you said, Terry, are aware that we are so disproportionately impacted by this disease. Right, right, thank you. So Dr. Fawn, over to you, the same question. Tell us a little bit about your work and tell us how you see black women being impacted. Sure. So um, some of the my work has already been discussed, at least in my intro. And thank you again for um, a great intro and for all of the energy. And I'm just so glad to be here. Um, thank you, everyone, for the invitation. So um, I look at Black caregivers, and I'm specifically interested in stress and resilience. And I've been doing this work for um, probably almost 15 years or so since graduate school. Um, and I've always focused on Black caregivers because it's personal for me, as well as just my professional interests. Um, I am a Black woman, and so I have seen the disproportionate um, impact that caregiving has on Black women. And as has already been stated, women are the caregivers. Women are the ones who are also impacted more um, disproportionately um, in the disease process. And so my work has focused on the caregiving aspect, but women are central because again, as a black woman, and again, as the, as the, the numbers indicate, black women are at risk. We're carrying the brunt of this disease. Right. And I know we're probably gonna talk about it a little later, but I often wonder is, are we the ones that are impacted so much because we carry the weight of the whole world? Hmm. I don't know. I, I, it makes me wonder, is that is that what it is? So Tina, we're going to jump back to you, my dear. And can mm -hmm. you share with us what is the research actually saying right now about why Black women are being diagnosed at a higher rate? Mm -hmm. There's lots of conversations centered around why Black women and Black people are at higher uh, risk for developing this disorder. We know that older Black people are at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease than Caucasians are. As stated before, we're two times more likely than they are. Um, but not only are we two times more likely, we are less likely to receive a diagnosis. And we're almost 30% less likely to receive treatment. And when we do receive a diagnosis, it's later in the disease process. Therefore, our cognitive decline is more severe, meaning that families don't have an opportunity to plan as they would have before. The other thing to consider is the lack of a timely and accurate diagnosis. Because we're not getting that diagnosis earlier in the disease process, we're not affording families with the opportunities and the resources and the tools that they need to provide their families with the support that they're going to need um, throughout the trajectory of the disease process. And while African Americans are about 13, make up 13 percent of the U.S. population, we're disproportionately impacted by this disease, and it's costing us a significant amount of money to provide care for those loved ones. So African Americans um, 
you know, research is now start showing us that racism may be a factor as well mm. as it relates to stress. So stress in our homes, stress in our families, stress on our jobs, and then the lived experience of being a Black person, Black woman in the United States of America brings another layer of stress. Stress can be connected to, linked to hypertension. And we know that Black women are disproportionately impacted by high blood pressure, diabetes, um, all these other uh, comorbidities that could also put them at greater risk. And sometimes people don't really like to consider these factors, but it's important for black women to know if you have heart disease or you're at risk, or risk for heart disease or cardiovascular disease or diabetes or hypertension, or um, you suffer with depression or you have a significant amount of stress and it's not being managed, the research is showing us that's going to put you at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Mm. In addition to the racial uh, factors that come on board with that as well, not just my lived experience being a black woman, but do I have a black son? Do I have black children? That stress of that as well. So there's lots of research on the horizon that's taking a significant look at the racial implications over the lifespan, not just one event, over the lifespan and what that's doing to my body makeup. And that's putting some women at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Right, thank you. So let me ask you this. Why do you think we're not getting this information sooner? Like, why isn't a 20 year old black woman mm -hmm. even hearing this information? Mm -hmm. Why is the 50 year old black woman hearing it? And maybe if I would have heard it when I was 20, I would have did better with myself. Right. So dementia is one of the diseases where we don't have standard protocols in place. Um, and here's an example of that. When I turned 50, you know, I got a lovely card in the mail from my doctor. I thought, oh my God, my doctor's so good to me. She's sending me a birthday card. When really on the back of it, it says, hey, you're 50. It's time for you to come in and have a colonoscopy done. It's a standardized protocol. If we had standard protocols that would engage people in the conversation, that would do a lot of, with the stigma associated with it. And it would open up the conversation. Your provider is at the crust of this. If your doctor would engage you in the conversation, families would be more engaged. Here's the dichotomy. Patients will say, if my, if my doctor was worried about my memory concerns, he would tell me about it. And doctors are saying, if my patients were concerned about their memories, they would tell me and I'd do something about it. Mm. They're not talking to each other. The conversation is not opening up. So folks are not aware and they're not engaged as we should be. Okay. Okay, either one of you might want to answer this. So what are some of the current studies looking at terms of dementia in communities of color? Well, a uh, few of the studies that are out there right now that are very, very promising, I'm going to look at my notes here, are biomarkers. So it's not going to be one magic pill that's going to make this work for us. Just a level set for everyone, there is no a curative mechanism right now for Alzheimer's disease or dementia. What is out there is something to help manage the symptoms. So research is taking a look at a couple of things, uh, blood, blood tests, saliva, you know, cerebral uh, spinal fluid. They can do PET scan and imaging where they can see that Alzheimer's almost 20 years before the first symptoms start to show up. Mm. This, the other thing that's very important is a study that's called the SPRINT study. Now, this study looks specifically at hypertension and teaching people how to get that systolic, that top number on your blood pressure down. So we, for years, have said, let's aim for 140. Research is showing us, let's get it down to 120 and manage it there. And they now have data that shows that 19% of people who are able to get that number down and keep it there, reduce their risk for mild cognitive impairment. 17% of people reduce their risk for dementia. 15% reduce their risk in a combined effort. So for black women who are disproportionately impacted by High blood pressure, this is important for us. We need to do everything we can to manage high blood pressure and to manage diabetes, high cholesterol, and stress. Because if we don't, it puts us at risk, more greater risk for developing Alzheimer's. Thank you.
Thank you for that. So Dr. Fon, we're going to come to you. So you're seeing the other side of this epi epidemic. And so what are you seeing in terms of the family structure after they've been caring for a family member diagnosed with dementia? Mm -hmm. So um, let me just add one thing that I wanted to tap into with, um, with Ms. Tina, uh, sure. what she mentioned about um, one of the reasons that I've seen that we don't usually have um, the information sooner is because we live or we still operate out of stigma. And mm -hmm. so we tend to not want to acknowledge the changes that we're seeing or we want to attribute it to normal aging. Well, that's how they've always been. Well, that's what it is. And so it's important to recognize some of those changes and not just immediately dismiss them as quote unquote normal, but also bring it to the attention of not just family members, um, but your providers as well. So I just wanted to add that on top of what's already been said. Right. Now, yes, um, I do see this on the other end and with the family structure. So caregiving is generally a long-term journey, particularly um, for Alzheimer's disease. It tends to be a longer uh, caregiving journey than, um, than some other disease processes. And so what I've seen in my work is that a lot of times caregivers are actually, family dynamics can play a big, big role. Um, so sometimes it can be, um, sometimes those, those situations within families are already existing in terms of maybe there are some unacknowledged um, disagreements or you know, some resentments that folks have been holding on for years. So when you now have a family member who has dementia and conversations need to be had and distribution of care, who's going to provide care for this person, who's going to do what, those conversations get really hard because of the resentments that already exist, um, or they get worse. <laughs> and then there's also the folks that don't contribute at all. So then you also have folks who, you know, you may have several siblings or children or what have you, and, and not everybody is on the same page. So that tends to cause some strain, um, a lot of strain actually. And so um, that's that's been one thing. And another thing that I will add is that everybody's at a different place of acceptance. So it's not just mm -hmm. stigma. Sometimes, you know, some people are just in denial. No, that's not what's happening. That's, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you've heard or read. That's not what's happening. But then there are others who are just grieving and just still stuck in just the, the reality of what's happening. And so all of those things can, can create a, um, a shift in the family dynamics. And so it can, it can really just make that, that anything that's fractured or has some, some little cracks already, it can make it worse. Right. Yeah, I know in my in my own family with my grandmother, there, there were six girls, there's six girls and one of them recognized that something wasn't quite right with granny like maybe eight years before and everybody else was like no, 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 no. And even when she got the diagnosis, a few of them were still in denial. So yeah, I, I, I feel you completely on that. So what are some of the red flags that the caregivers need to be on the lookout for? So again, caregiving can be, you know, it's a, it's a long-term journey, um, but folks um, on the outside, because sometimes it's hard for caregivers themselves to recognize things, but some of the things to pay attention to, and this is not a blame thing ever, um, but sometimes the person that you're providing care for, their, their condition may worsen despite everything that you're trying to do. So pay attention to that. And those individuals who are on the outskirts, those other family members who notice that, that's a conversation to have that that caregiver is overwhelmed. Um, sometimes those caregivers may feel like they are the only one who is having this experience. And that's also not, not necessarily true. I mean, just from the introductions alone, I, everybody has been impacted by dementia on this call and I'm sure our audience has as well. So it's important. So those are their flags in terms of making sure that folks don't feel like they're alone or if they are feeling like they're alone, that's a sign that they're starting to, um, to feel burdened. In addition, and with the pandemic, this has made things so much harder, but it's also important to make sure that caregivers have um, some time to recharge and to be alone. Again, that's hard right now, but if they're not getting that time, that actually contributes to, um, to those red flags of you know feeling overwhelmed, not really being able to do what they thought they could do before. Um, in addition, they... Um, they're actual, so a lot of times we do what we need to do to get by. I mean, that's, that's just our history. Um, but sometimes some of the things that folks do to get by um, may be considered harmful. And so, you know, let's say smoking, I'll, I'll just use that. And, and as a nurse, you know, we all know that smoking is proven to be harmful. 
Um, but for someone who is, you know, providing care, that that can be their release, right? But at the same time, we know that over time that that, that can become more harmful. But maybe they're increasing their cigarette smoking. You know, maybe it was one pack a day or what have you, and now they're up to three packs a day. So we really got to look at some of the behaviors that are happening and how they're actually making the situation even worse. Um, and again, I use smoking as the example that just popped in my head, but there can be other examples as well as just the behaviors that we do in order to get by, but we're, we're doing it in such a way that it's creating more harm than it is help. Right, exactly. And this pandemic is exacerbating the situation. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So yeah. what, the last question right now for you is, what are you seeing being done to address some of the barriers? So I see a lot of, um, there are a lot of things that are actually already helping um, right now in terms of, you know, we'll talk about it maybe later on because it's a sponsor from the Alzheimer's Association, but there are systems and things that exist to help caregivers. But I would like to um, start a new conversation or shift the current narrative that self-sacrifice is a good thing. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I think we need to start normalizing caregivers caring for themselves because yes. you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. Um, you don't help anyone if you're not helping yourself. And I don't say that lightly because I know that the journey is hard and I know you're doing the best you can. But that self-sacrifice narrative, we've got to change that. And so I see some of those things. Um, I mean, I'll just use me as an example, just, just starting to have those conversations to shift that. Um, but also we want to make sure that we're keeping appointments, um, you know, going to, you know, the doctor when you're not putting it off um, and then asking for help. I think that those are some really important things that can, you know, start to, to shift the dynamic and don't be afraid to ask for help. Somebody out there can give you what you need, but you have to open your mouth. You don't, don't let pride, let it go. Don't let shame, let it go. Those are some of the things that, that can be done in addition to the resources that are that are already out there. Thank you for that. Yeah, I made my mom come in and listen so she could hear you say that about that self-care. I'm like, come on, mom, let's let, you gotta go 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 for a break. Go for a break. Go. It's okay. Yeah. We got Daddy, we got him. Okay, let, so this is for both of you. At the Alzheimer's Association, there's a multifaceted approach to Alzheimer's disease and the other related dimensions. People probably need to understand that Alzheimer's is a form of dementia, but um, in a, so how can people make the most of the services offered for both the patient and the caregiver? Tina, you muted, Tina. Thank you, I got it. So I would say, and just to, you know, just, just kind of hang a little linchpin on something that Dr. Carter said when talking about family members and caregivers. The Alzheimer's Association, they do provide care managers and care supporters. You can call the 800 number any day, time or night and get a live person on the phone who can help you to develop a plan. One of the challenges when you talked about what systems and what support should be in place is that People don't know what to ask. You know, they've never been in this space before. And if you're not getting that guidance from your provider, you're like, oh, okay, I, I think this is the way it's supposed to go. My doctor said my dad has Alzheimer's and they gave me a prescription for Aricep and I went out the door. So they don't know what to ask. So putting together a plan, a supportive team, I call it Tina's four A's, making sure you have uh, first accept, oh my God, this is happening and it's happening in our house. So accepting what's going on is huge. And then taking action, getting on the website, calling other supporters, calling your local AAA, your Alzheimer's Association. Find out what are the resources in your community after you take action. And then acknowledge what you can do and what you can't do. Know what your skills are. Pull in other people who can help. You know, if you've got a spending problem, maybe you should manage the money. So let somebody else manage the money and you manage the house or you manage the doctor's appointment. So figure out those things and separate them out. And then the big kahuna is to let allow, allow people to help. Yes. People, may, people will ask for help, but they won't let help in or they will say, um, nobody will help me and they're so stressed out and they become angry, but they either don't know what to ask for or they're not allowing it to happen and working with sometimes another person 
like at the Alzheimer's Association, we're one of those types of resources, but ours just is at no cost where somebody else can come in, listen to the story of everybody and help try to put a plan together to help the family move forward because this is going to be a long journey. It's not going to end overnight. It's gonna be a long journey. Dr. Fine, you wanna add anything to that? Sure. Um, so I, I, first of all, I am definitely a big fan of the Alzheimer's Association and all of the various resources that they provide. So I fully support um, reaching out, um, especially the 24-7 um, hotline. Um, I will add a few other resources just because um, the information is so important to just have um, a variety of places to reach out to. But I do want to emphasize that sometimes it's just talking to other people because again, I can't help but just notice how many folks on this call today have already been through this experience. And sometimes folks you know have done it and been there as well and they can offer tips and, and advice or lessons that they learned too. And again, it's an individual journey. So what worked for one person may not work for you, but it's so helpful to still have that information. Um, and then what worked yesterday may not work the next day, but that's okay because the more you talk to folks, the more tools you can put in your toolkit. Um, I will also just highlight um, that the, the AARP has a lot of resources for caregivers. Mm -hmm. The National Alliance of Caregiving has a lot of resources for caregivers. Now, these are not always dementia specific, but mm -hmm. they do have a lot of resources that can be tapped into. Things like today coming to these types of workshops um, is so important and so helpful. And then to tell somebody else. So maybe somebody you know wasn't able to attend today, but tell them what you learned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, keep that information sharing going along because I think that we, um, I mean, it's great to have the, the quote unquote experts and the, the folks who know things, but, but we are experts too. And, and a lot of times that experience is the expertise that we, um, that we, we don't want to minimize and downplay. And so sometimes it's just nice to just ask somebody else, well, what did you do and what did you learn? And again, in addition to everything else, I do have a variety of other resources that, um, that I can share in terms of books and things like that. Um, and I'd be happy to share it. Um, with the, with the Alzheimer's Association so it can be mailed out later on or I can put it in the chat, whatever is um, most helpful. But there are several books from caregivers, um, Black women caregivers who um, share their journey, including um, B. Smith's husband, who was also a, a caregiver. Um, so those are some other resources that can be helpful to let people know, again, you're not alone. There's someone else who's been here and done this and then some other tips that can be helpful. Right. Yeah. yeah. That probably would be helpful if you could uh, drop those in the chat. Sure will. Tina, did you want to say something else? Yeah, Terry, I was just going to say one other resource is sometimes we are the greatest resource we can give back to our community. So if I've been impacted, if I was a caregiver, even if I'm still in the fire, I might be able to help start a support group in my church in my neighborhood, in my community, if I've got some free time, maybe I can go out in the community and help with community education or go to health fairs. We need help desperately for folks who look like the community to take resources back in those neighborhoods. That's a, a, especially in your own church and in your own circle, because you're already a face that they know and they trust. So if you have free time, we'd love to have you partner with the Alzheimer's Association to help them get that information into the community. And if all else fails and you go, dear God, I heard so much information on there. I can't remember what, what I heard. It was all good, but I don't remember any of it. You can <laughs> always, always dial 211. Pick up your phone and dial your local 211. 211, and you can say, I want to find out information about Alzheimer's, or they can connect you to the local Alzheimer's Association, they can connect you to the local AARP, Area Agency on Aging, whatever you need, your local 211, it is your community resource hub. Thank you. So what I want to make sure everybody took away from that, this whole part of this conversation is planning, planning, mm -hmm. and more planning. Because mm -hmm. the sooner you plan, the better off you'll be. And it doesn't even have to be about Alzheimer's. It could be about the fact that your parents are aging or that you're aging, whatever the case may be, planning ahead will um, hopefully alleviate some of the issues that you might encounter later on. So this next mm -hmm. question is for the planning, y'all. This next question is for the both of you as well. So both sides of the dementia journey can have, did I say that already? I can't even see. Okay. 
<laughs> both sides of the dementia journey can have institutional or implicit biases that affect the quality of treatment or access to support resources for the patient and the caregiver. Did we talk about that yet? Mm -mm. Okay. So what are you seeing being done to address that? Mm -hmm. Who you wants me to go first or Ms. Tina to go first? Dr. Fon, you go first. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, one thing that, that I think has been really helpful is that, well, a few things um, really quickly. So one is that in January, the California uh, Master Plan of Aging was released, um, which actually does have two of their five goals are focused specifically on equity and inclusion, as well as caregivers specifically. Um, I'll drop that also in the chat as well, just so that folks can look that up on their own. But that just demonstrates a, a, a vested interest um, at least at the state level for the, the importance of focusing in on caregivers. And again, we live in California, which is a very diverse state. Um, and so being able to meet individual needs based on um, culture and ethnicity and, and different backgrounds is really important. Um, in addition, so there's also legislation that has been um, put out that is also going to be helpful for caregivers. And so um, one is the CARE Act, the Caregiver Advise, Record, Enable Act. And this actual act is more, is more helpful for caregivers who may have a family member who goes to the hospital, because let's be honest, just because a person is living with dementia does not mean that they don't still get sick and need to go to the hospital. But sometimes when they return back home, the amount of care on top of dementia uh, level care is you know, providing injections, changing wounds. And a lot of times folks don't know how to do that, but this act um, has helped to provide that kind of smoother transition and information to help with that. And the other act is the Raise Family Caregiver Act, which is a strategy um, that actually focuses on multiple sectors. So community, government, healthcare, um, as a way to help support caregivers. So those are some of the things that I'm, I'm already seeing that are important for caregivers. Um, and, and it's a promising direction. You know, and one of the things I know folks are having lots of conversations centered around equity. They're mm -hmm. taking a look at equity, but also not just equity, but also um, equality and access. They're not the same things. You know, equity has so much more to do with um, you know, leveling the playing field. Do we all have the same thing? Can, do I have access to the resources that I need? If I know what I need, but I don't know how to access the things that I need, or it's not in my neighborhood, or it's not in my community, that is a problem. The pandemic has brought some of this further to the forefront. You know, even when they're talking about, um, we're going to put vaccines in, um, like CVS is all around the country. That's great. Except in some neighborhoods, there is no CBS. Right. You know, and in some neighborhoods, we don't have a grocery store that sells that, which means that it's not equitable. Everybody's not. You've got to figure out a way to make it equitable for everyone. And one of the ways you can do that really is in our faith communities. Our faith communities are strong. Our leaders are strong. And that, that's a great opportunity to open up the conversation so people can get what they need and have us get over some of these barriers. But another significant tool that we have are, is clinical trials. African Americans, we have got to participate in clinical trials. Yes, we don't have great history with clinical trials. We got to get over some of that. We acknowledge that, but we've got to figure this out because as my good friend, Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Jackson would say is, if you are not at the table, then you are on the menu. So you want to be at the table so your voice can be heard. So we have got to get involved in some of these things that we're not always uh, um, you know, comfortable with, but we want to make sure our voice is heard so that it can be more equitable and so access can be provided to us in a different way. Thank you. Dr. Fon, anything to add? You good? Mm -hmm. Okay, no. so I'm watching the time and I see we got a lot of questions and Carla, I really want us to get to the questions because I, you know, this is, you, People want to know some things. So we want to thank both Ms. Tina Thomas and Dr. Fine. Got them. Give it up, y'all. Give it up. Give it up. We want to thank you ladies for joining us today. There's so much information. I could literally talk to y'all for three more hours because it's a lot that we need to talk about. Um, black folk, we got to start talking about the stuff. Don't, don't put granny in the bedroom and just leave her there. No, granny need to come out. Mm -hmm. Granny need to go outside. Granny need to interact. Don't just, what, what does Cicely Tyson say? You don't just, um, 
toss away your elders like an old shoe. That's not what that's not what we do. So we got to start having these conversations. So uh, Carla, I'm going to throw it. You want me to throw it oh, back to you so you Ron, can get questions? I have the first question for the panel is, can drinking cause you to have dementia? Is there any correlation to alcohol use? Mm -hmm. So there is a form of dementia that is directly connected to this Korsoff's disease. So at, um, excessive alcohol abuse, not just drinking alcohol, but that abusive piece, um, there is some connection there. It does typically impact younger people. Um, so there is some connection there. You should be talking to your doctor about what is acceptable for you based on your age, types of medications that you may be taking, how your body metabolizes alcohol. So as we get older, we should be drinking less, not more. <laughs> oh, Say that again, God. Tina. Say that again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, can many strokes result in dementia or Alzheimer's? You want to answer, Bob? Okay. Yeah, so um, this isn't quite my expertise, but I know that there is such a thing as the vascular dementia piece. And so um, that, that level of dementia is actually influenced by um, many strokes. And so there is uh, a dementia type that is um, associated with the many strokes. Um, but again, you've got to go to your providers um, because a lot of times there are uh, what they call mixed dementia. So there are several aspects of dementia that are that may be happening. And so um, so I'll just leave it at that. But yes, that can be a factor. Absolutely. And African Americans are disproportionately impacted by that because, you know, we are more impacted by vascular disease mm -hmm. and, um, you know, other cardiovascular issues, high blood pressure, those things we talked about, which could put you at greater risk for strokes. So if you know someone or if you are having many strokes, you should be aggressively trying to work with your provider to get that treated because you don't want it to get to the point where you have, you know, post-stroke Alzheimer's disease. There are many people who have Alzheimer's disease or very advanced dementia types that show up on the other side of a stroke. Exactly. Um, I also, I'm seeing questions about preventative uh, measures and following this panel, I will be leading a presentation about reducing dementia, dementia risk. So please stay on, especially for those of you who had questions about how do you prevent dementia? We're going to talk about that. There's some significant lifestyle changes that you can do. So stay tuned for that. Um, another question, what are some questions to ask our primary care doctor to get proper early testing or diagnosis? So, I mean, one of the things to know right away is that, you know, these memory issues, memory inconsistencies that you're noticing, it is not normal. So it's not a normal part of aging. So what you don't want to happen is don't let the doctor say to you, oh, your mother's 80. It's normal. It is not normal. So the two questions I always say, say to families to ask the doctor is, if the doctor says we think it might be dementia, now don't let them say she has a touch of dementia. That's not a diagnosis. If they say it's dementia, you want to know what kind of dementia is it and what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. So you want them to know right out of the gate. Yes, I know that's not a cure, but what are we going to do to manage this disease and this disorder? And then if they say we're going to send you for testing, ask questions about the test. What type of testing? If they give you medication, ask about the medication. What does this medication do? What is it intended to prevent? So that the doctor knows you are informed and you want information about this disease process. Yeah. Fine, you're a nurse, so you know all about it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that you hit on something so important, which is please do not let someone try to tell you that this is a part of normal aging. Yes, there can be a variety of factors that can contribute to dementia, but normal aging is, is not necessarily um, a cause. It, it is not a cause of dementia. It is not dementia. It is not normal. And also, it is so important that we, we start understanding dementia. No, okay. Dementia is an umbrella. Um, an umbrella term. And so it, there are a variety of types of dementia. And so it's, it's not enough to just say, oh, this person has dementia. So I love that advice. And it's so important because we do need to know what type of dementia, because that dictates what type of planning you need, because each, each type may have different needs and different 
skill sets that you need to manage. So I, I just am tapping on to what you already said. <laughs> okay, we have another question. Um, are primary doctors trained appropriately? What do you see in terms of what can be done to educate the primary doctor population? So I'll jump in really quickly and take this one. So there is, um, I, before coming to California, and I know it's happening in California too, um, there was a, a major need to, uh, to train and educate primary care providers. It's not that they don't care, um, but they're not specialized in recognizing dementia. And so there was a national effort called the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, which has been done across the country to actually train um, providers or to provide education to providers, but the, the ultimate goal is to get those providers to recognize when to refer. And so, um, so providers um, may have had a lot of experience in their practice to see a variety of individuals with dementia, but they don't always know or they don't always have that, um, that, that knowledge. And so um, one of the, the, the newer initiatives has been to um, train those individuals to at least understand dementia better, but also to make sure that they're referring to specialists. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of providers um, so um, we, you know, certain areas of the, of the, of the country are, are, are lacking providers because, you know, rural communities and, and things of that nature don't always have the same access. When we talk about equitable access, that's not always there. Uh, oh. And the, the Affordable Care Act tried to help providers a little bit back in 2011. Built into the Affordable Care Act is an opportunity for folks to have an annual wellness exam. So for those of you who are on Medicare, every year you can get, have your annual wellness exam and your annual cognitive screening. Less than 20% of providers are doing the annual cognitive screening. So when you go to the doctor every year for your annual physical, say to the doctor, oh yeah, I would like to have my cognitive screening as well. It should happen maybe in another visit because it's gonna take about 40 minutes. Your Medicare pays for it. Um, and this gives them a baseline. So this, you're, you're trying to help your provider get there. Um, just like Dr. Fawn said, look, providers may have one class in, about this. So they know what it is. They understand the pathology of it. They don't always know how to talk to their patients about it. And that's why we are advocating and doing everything we can to give information, not just to doctors, but to give it to the community because you can take it to the doctor. And I've told my doctors things and she have to get on the internet and look it up. So, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. No, right. she's trying to get the answer, I'm okay. But if you know the questions to ask, you can push your doctor in a different direction. Good answer. Um, here's another one. What strategies do you suggest for caregivers to engage in to release their stress and battle the feelings of guilt when they feel overwhelmed. I suggested to a friend that he journal as a safe space where he could release his feelings without judgment or fear of hurting someone's feelings. Well, I, I oh, okay. So I think that that's a, a great tip. Um, you know, not everyone is a journal person. And so, um, you know, sometimes those self-care strategies are, you know, exercise, even little stuff around the house, um, chair exercises, for example, chair yoga. I actually just discovered chair yoga. Um, I actually, arthritis runs in my family. So unfortunately, yes, I, I'm doing chair yoga. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so there are those types of things, those types of uh, activities as well. You know, many of the, the similar, um, many of the other traditional, I guess I'll use that word, types of things, eating right, getting sleep, but yes, those outlets are definitely um, self-care, but it just depends on what's helpful for that person. So maybe they like to draw, drawing can be good. And again, finding even those five minutes of time, because especially in a pandemic and just in general, sometimes it's hard to find that time, um, but, but it really is whatever gives that person a sense of relief and joy and outlet. Um, and that, that guilt and shame is real um, and, and it's, it, it does take time to let that go but to also counter that, that, that type of narrative that's in our minds with, 
I'm doing this for me so that I can take better care of the person that I love. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it happens overnight, but it's so important to find those little things. Um, a good cup of coffee, but maybe depending on how much care you're giving, the coffee gets cold, but warm it up and enjoy it anyway. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, just uh, music. I just saw something that just said music that reminded me um, music can be a great outlet dancing around the house for five minutes. You know, some of these things don't have to be long. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to take away from um, Miss Tina, but yeah, that journal is a good start, but it may not be for everyone. So find those different things. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next, as a new grad nurse, what are ways I can help fight the stigma within our community and start these conversations in the Black community when it comes to dementia and Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. Great. You can ask families if you're working with families. Um, let's talk about brain health. Let's talk about your plan for brain health, and that that moves it away from. Alzheimer's disease, dementia, it's brain health. What are we going to do? What is your plan to keep your brain healthy, strong, and stimulated as you age? And if they just talked about that at every doctor's office and or visit, it changes the narrative. It's pushed away from something negative and we're focusing on something very positive. I mean, just change the narrative. Um, be very authentic and by all means, always tell people the truth. Right. All right. And then next question. Um, uh, this is asking about, am I right to hear that the propensity for the disease is not genetic? Can we talk a little bit about those risk factors? Mm -hmm. so the, 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 the greatest risk factor connected to this disorder is age. The majority of people that it impacts are older adults. Um, so Age is the greatest risk factor for this disorder. That's really important to remember. Now, there are deterministic genes. So there are genes that, uh, and you see this often in people who are younger in the disease process. Uh, if my father had younger onset Alzheimer's disease, he developed it in his 50s, I would be concerned because he could pass on that deterministic gene to me, which would put me at significant high risk for developing the disorder. But if my mother had Alzheimer's disease and it happened to her when she was 70, 75, 80, I'm not that worried about it because the risk of me developing that disease is low. Now, it's higher for me than someone who doesn't have it in their family at all. But just because it's in my family does not mean it is an absolute for me. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Let's look at what else we have here questions. Um, together... I'm sorry, one moment. Our, our, um, well, this goes back to the, our, pri our primary care doctors trained appropriately, old age and memory loss for some folks seem to be linked together as normal getting older. How can, how can this be rectified? And what are you thinking that, what should people be asking for when they go in? Wait, can you just repeat that again? Um, are primary doctors trained appropriately? Old age and memory loss, for some folks, believe seemed seem to be linked together as normal old getting older, or folks may think they are losing their mind. How can this be rectified? What what should they be asking when they're seeing those warning signs? What should they be asking their doctors about? What are the questions that they need to ask for to get that proper diagnosis? Mm -hmm. I think that some of the things that, that have come up already were, um, were a little helpful for that, I think. But in terms of the normal aging versus, um, you know, getting older or, you know, not just dismissing it as getting old, um, I think it's important to... I'm trying to remember where that was. There, there are some resources where... Um, actually, it may even be just the Alzheimer's Association, but you can find um, some resources that do differentiate what is um, normal versus, you know, something to ask questions. Actually, yeah, it is the 10 warning signs. My goodness. Right, right, right. 
um, so that that's one thing. And I, I think it's it's really important. And Ms. Tina has brought this up before too, and I'll just go ahead and reinforce it here, which is we, we've got to be advocates for our family members. You know that person better than anybody else. And so, you know, I, I'm just going to say it here. You know, sometimes those gut feelings, just go ahead and find out, you know, just take the next step. And it's okay to get a second and a third opinion. We don't have to always stay with the first opinion. Um, because if you notice that something is different, it's really important to, to feel free to go ahead and find somebody else and to, to do those questions and advocate for your family member. Right. And, and really knowing the difference between that normal aging and, and what something is, is not normal. If your loved one is starting to have memory loss or memory inconsistency issues that are starting to interrupt how they live their everyday life. This is important. What I would urge for you is when you go to the doctor, rather than say, mother's becoming forgetful, uh, give the doctor a scenario. This is what I saw, and here's when I saw it, and here's how long it happened, here's, this was the intensity around it, and this is what we did to resolve it. Paint a scenario rather than just a statement, because the doctor can't see what's going on in your house. So yeah, oh, some people think that memory loss is synonymous with getting older. The reality is our brains are changing as we get older, so there are some changes, but it's not the same. So. Uh, don't just say to the doctor, she, mom, is, this is happening. Mom got lost. She did when coming home from church. She's been at that church for 30 years. Right. It was early in the afternoon. Right. Um, there was not bad traffic. There was no weather. She got disoriented. She called me. She was frantic and she didn't know how to get home. Paint the picture and don't be embarrassed because if you don't give the provider the information, they won't be able to help you. All right. Well, unfortunately, we have come to our time. It is one o'clock. <laughs> and there's so many questions and, and so many answers that we all feel like we want to continue to learn more. All of you have been a wonderful resource for everyone here tuning in today. And we appreciate you sharing your expertise and knowledge. I would like to invite everyone to stay online and joining us for healthy living for brain and body. Cause I'm going to specifically go into the things that you can do to reduce your risk for developing dementia. There are lifestyle changes that we all can implement that can help reduce our risk within our community. So please stay online. We'll, we'll go to the presentation in just a moment. I'd like to thank Tina Thomas for joining us today from the West, West, Western Virginia and Virginia area. I'd like to thank Dr. Fawn Cothran from the UC, Betty, UC Davis Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Thank you, Terry Carlisle, our community representative and volunteer. And thank you to our sponsors, the AKA chapter, Rho Delta Omega, also to the Capital City Black Nurses Association and the Bay Area Black Nurses Association. And thank you to Valerie Toller, our board representative for sharing her story. We appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, you can find so many resources online through our website at alz.org. You can look at the videos of education courses. You can sign up for courses. And, and find out more information, consider a support group. We have wonderful support groups available all around that you can dial into now. And so there is a support group out there that will fit your schedule. But it, it's a, a wonderful su a support resources. And on our website, alz.org, there are support resources for family caregivers and people with a diagnosis. So take advantage share this information so that you are knowledgeable and can be a better caregiver or just a, a knowledgeable person with the disease. We want to utilize the knowledge resources out there and get families connected so that they are not going it alone. Thank you, everyone. Stay online. We will switch over to the presentation in just a moment, but we appreciate you joining and register and continue to learn and um, grow in your dementia journey for a better journey. 
Well, thank, thank you, you so much, Carla, for having us today. And I'm so happy to say I was so thrilled to spend a portion of my, my 53rd birthday with you all today. Ah! So I won't be able to stay on because my, my crew was at the door. like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's one of my birthday presents. It's, it's a mannequin. It's a half mannequin. And they're like, what, what do you want? I said, I want to put a shirt on it, you know, and put it in my background since I'm living at work. I have to amuse myself, everybody. So that's what that's all about for those who was like, what is she doing? Is she at a store? No, I'm at home in my office enjoying my 53rd birthday present. So thank you, Carla, so very, very much. And I had a great time with you all today and blessings to you all. Well, happy birthday, Tina. Thank you for sharing part of your special day with us and to sharing it with our community. We all want that shirt. <laughs> so, all right. See you. I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to switch over to healthy living for brain and body. Let's, let's educate ourselves and figure out what can we do to minimize our risk of developing dementia. Yes, yes. Tina, are you, I mean, uh, Carla, are you gonna go over to the 10 signs? To look for? I, I will talk about the 10 signs a Perfect. little bit. Okay. But that's a whole nother presentation. I know. I would love to share. Mm -hmm. One moment. There we go. All right. Well, as I said, I'm going to be sharing with you today healthy living for brain and body. And it's the current research about tips you can utilize in your everyday life to minimize your risk. You know, I shared in the beginning that um, I work at the Alzheimer's Association as an outreach specialist, but this is a very personal journey for me because my mother was diagnosed with vascular dementia around three years ago. But knowing what we know now, we know that those warning signs were there much earlier than my family recognized. I'm gonna share with you the, the reasons you wanna take care of yourself. I'm gonna share some strategies that are talking about physical health and exercise, diet and nutrition, cognitive activity, and social engagement. Aging well depends on your genes the, your environment and your lifestyle. And lifestyle choices may help keep your body and brain healthy. And what we're learning is that lifestyle choices can actually potentially overtake your genetic risk, which is really a, a significant factor. And we're finding that there are research studies going on that if you're interested, you can find out more about the pointer study that is based in, it's nationwide, but in Northern California, we have a site at UC Davis. So check into that because there are things that you can do that could potentially reduce your risk. And it's looking like even in the earlier stages of dementia that it may possibly be able to, to slow the progression. So we wanna be armed with all the knowledge possible. We know that the brain is the control center of the body and there are 100 billion neurons and nerve cells creating that network that is communicating. And that's what holds those memories. The signals traveling through the brain form the memories, thoughts, and feelings. And Alzheimer's disease destroys brain cells. One thing you may, some of you may know if you've been to our, our education programs before, Dementia is an umbrella. Alzheimer's is one form of dementia. Some of the other forms are vascular dementia, which does impact many African-Americans because there's a link to high blood pressure, Lewy body dementia, and frontal temporal lobe dementia. Those are kind of the main four. And out of those, Alzheimer's is the one that's more prevalent. Your heart and brain are interrelated. And what you do to protect your heart can also protect, help, help protect your brain and continue to help your brain operate at its best. We have a saying, heart health is brain health. So, you know, this is American Heart Month, but
but anything doing with your heart makes it brain oriented. So think about protecting your heart to protect your brain. The brain needs blood flow. The brain depends on oxygen and adequate blood flow to work well. 25% of blood from every heartbeat goes to the brain. And dementia is caused by many different diseases and conditions. We know it's not a part of normal aging as we heard it from our panelists. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause. And known risk factors for Alzheimer's includes age. That is the number one factor. By the time people are 85, 30% of 85 year olds will have some form of dementia. Head injury. CTE, you know what? Make sure you sign up for the men's talk next Saturday, same time, noon, because we're going to have an expert um, who was a professor at George Washington University talking about head injuries. He's a former NFL player. And as you know, you've heard probably in the news, NFL players are having a higher incidence of developing dementia. We're going to talk about that in the men's talk, Black Men and Dementia. So go back today when we're done and register for that next week and bring your male friends too. So going on, cardiovascular factors are risk and fewer years of formal education. So it's all about stimulating the brain. And, you know, we heard some interesting information last year at our Alzheimer's International Conference that even early childhood education can impact later on um, your risk factors. So we need quality education experiences for our young children too. So when we talk about health disparities, it goes all the way back to childhood. So let's advocate for quality education all the way through and keep learning for your entire life. Therapies for Alzheimer's can treat the symptoms. Uh, but they cannot cure it, they can't prevent it, or even slow the disease progression. But you do want to know what medications are out there that may help your family member um, just adapt better to you, the environment that they're in. And that's a conversation you want to have with your doctor so you can thoroughly talk it out. But there are treatments out there that you should be aware of. The first aspect we're going to talk about is physical health and exercise. You know, this is something that we constantly hear about, but it's becoming exercise is like your daily medicine. We know that cardiovascular activity may reduce your risk of cardio cognitive decline. Regular and vigorous exercise leads to increased blood flow and other physical activities may also yield benefits. There's no single right or wrong answer. It just got to get moving. And what you need to do is glow. You don't have to drip with sweat. You don't have to be out there all afternoon or all day long. The recommended amount of exercise is about 30 minutes a day. They're showing that walking. You just need to be walking at a clip where you're a little breathless, but you don't have to be completely winded. Start small and build it up. I'm going to skip the videos because I want to keep us on track, but this gentleman Woodley is talking about start small, do something every day and every day that you possibly can, like five days a week and pick something that you like. So Woodley was saying, don't make it into a big deal. And sometimes I, I have that too, like, oh, I got to get the right outfit on. I got to get this. I got to get that. You know what? I just put on my sneakers now. And I know I can't take those sneakers off until I get out there. And sometimes during the pandemic, I have to take a little recess. And I get up from my desk because I found that I've been more sedentary. I get up from my desk and I take a 10-minute recess. And I just get out, walk up and down my street. People may wonder, like, what's she doing out there? But you just got to get moving and pick something you like. Don't pick something that you don't like. To, I'm not a runner. You will not hear me saying, oh, I'm going to start. I'm not even going to do a 5K. I just, I'm not a runner. So I pick the things I like. I like dancing. 
I took a tap dance class. I find that fun. I get out, I walk, I got a dog. He has to be walked. So it's for him and it's for me. It's my, it's my medicine. Um, move safely, talk to your doctor before you start anything, you know, dramatic and you got to get your heart rate up. You got to glow a little bit. And if it helps, get a friend to do it with you in a socially distant manner. I talk to my girlfriend. We have our little check-ins when I'm walking and, and always be safe and check with your doctor before you start a new program. And the other things we can do, we talked about this earlier, stop smoking, avoid excess alcohol, get adequate sleep. There's been a lot of study on sleep. And if you're not sleeping well, that is a medical concern. You need to get your sleep, your quality sleep, treat it like a medical issue, talk to your doctor about it, figure out what other aspects are, that are going on in your life that can be a, um, affecting the quality of sleep because sleep is important. That is when your brain clears out the plaques and you need to be in a deep sleep, that, that REM sleep. So really look at that if you're not sleeping well. Avoid head injury. If your kids play soccer, no more head in the ball anymore. Um, my daughter played volleyball. Oh my goodness, she had two concussions. I felt like, I think you might be done because you are going to be increasing, you know, risk for dementia later on. So look at that, protect your head, manage stress, look at those stressors in your life and figure out what you can do to reduce that stress. Treat depression. Depression and dementia can go hand in hand. So you wanna make sure you're addressing depression and taking it seriously. Mental health leads to, mental wellness leads to physical wellness. And make sure you're, you're getting to the doctor. Don't put those doctor visits off. Know your numbers, monitor numbers and take action. You should know your blood pressure. You should know your blood sugar. Your A1C is that long-term blood sugar rate. Get your weight in control if it's not in control and know your cholesterol levels. Those are those four numbers you should know. When you have your blood work at your annual physical, you should be looking at that blood work, that lab work. What did it say? When I was younger, I didn't pay attention to that because I felt fine. But as I got older, I asked my doctor, ooh, this has changed over between this year and last year. What do you think? Talk to your doctor about those numbers. Don't just take them as statistics. Those are key indicators of your health and wellness. Diet and nutrition. We hear a lot about diet and nutrition. We know that what's good for your heart may also be good for your brain. Nutritious food is fuel for your brain. Think about what you're putting in your mouth. That is fueling your body, providing sustenance. Make sure it's the best quality of you're making those decisions for quality food for your for the quality of that body. A lot of it, you don't put it in cheap gas in your car. You don't want to water down. Well, think about what you're putting in your in your body. Um, following some dietary guidelines can reduce your risk of heart disease, cancer and Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, stroke and diabetes. We are learning so much about the impact of nutrition that we really need to look at how are we fueling our bodies. Um, I'm gonna skip this video because I'm not sure if you can hear them, but this is Dr. Claire Morris and she's talking about what So we know that eating fruits and vegetables, unprocessed foods, nuts, beans, um, whole grains, lean meats, fish and poultry, and quality vegetable oils. We want to avoid the saturated fats, the trans fats, the processed, the highly processed foods. I know sometimes processed food can be faster food, but we have to look at what can we do to make unprocessed foods our go-to choices. Solid fat, sugar and salt, 
got to get that sodium down because if your sodium's up, so is your blood pressure. Deep fried foods and unhealthy fast foods. So really making quality, good food decisions. And you know, we talk about the Mediterranean diet being one that's a good diet to follow. But you know what? I say any cultural diet can be made to be a good diet. If you look at um, traditional African-American foods, we've got green leafy vegetables in there, collard greens, make sure you're just preparing them in a way. Look at that sodium content. If you can reduce that, that makes those collard greens an excellent green leafy vegetable. Mustard greens, okra, all of those traditional foods, the black eyed peas, we need those legumes in our diet. Those sweet potatoes, look at how you're preparing it. Maybe take some of the butter out and maybe lighten up on the brown sugar because, you know, I love sweet potatoes with my brown sugar and my butter. But figure out how can I still enjoy this, but make it more healthy. And so in those lean, those lean proteins, those meat or those other protein sources, look at those and how you're preparing them so that that can be a part of your healthy diet. And if you're taking supplements and vitamins, talk to your doctor. You wanna make sure you're taking the right thing in the right amounts. You do wanna make sure you're not having any nutritional deficiencies because that can sometimes lead to memory loss. So you wanna get that checked out and always work with your doctor. Cognitive activity, that is huge. You know, as children, we were asked every day, what'd you learn today? How, how many of you as adults have asked yourself, what'd you learn today? <laughs> Not too often. We're, we're constantly bombarded with information, but are we learning? So we want to keep our mind active and forming new connections among brain cells and learning does that. You know, I'll share with you a story about when I was taking, when I first started my adult tap dance class, I was doing it for fun, but I have two left feet. So I'm not the dancer. I'm not the drill team girl or any of that, but I was just having a good time. And when I first started, my head would hurt when I left that dance studio. I'd be dripping with sweat too, but my head was hurting. And I was like, oh my God, am I concentrating that much? But then as I noticed, as I went on, my I started to get things faster. And it wasn't so much building upon, you know, previously learned steps. I was starting to get the new steps faster. So I knew something was happening in my brain that it wasn't taking me going home and practice something like literally like a hundred times before I could get a little movement or a combination. I was picking up a lot faster. Now I'm not gonna be on, what's that dance show, um, World of Dance but I'm getting better. And I think it's because I'm forming, you know, new, new neurons, new brain cells and, and stimulating brain. So what I'm saying is try to pick up something new and, and find something that you enjoy. Also, cognitive activity encourages blood flow to the brain. So you want that thinking to happen and mentally stimulating activities may possibly maintain or even improve cognition. And um, engaging in formal education will keep your brain healthy and can provide protection against developing dementia. So look at what can I, do, what can I learn? You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, we were doing a lot of like TV watching, binge watching. And I finally said, this is enough. We are not gonna sit, sit around during our free time just you know, watching television after television. But I said, we need to get some hobbies going. And my teenage daughter asked me, what's a hobby? And I just had to chuckle. It's like, you don't know about times when we used to finish our work and we would go and do something like a project. And so she had to start, it's like, well, we're gonna have to find you a hobby, something you can do. So we started her scrapbooking but it's so important. So if you have, if you played an instrument before in the past, start again, keep playing. You know, they say singing and although we can't be together in choirs right now, but still the singing, the music, they really show um, a, a good correlation. There's been some research about what that can do, but any hobby, woodworking, 
Puzzles are great. We, as growing up, we always kind of had a puzzle around. So we brought puzzles back into our life. And you know what? That really helped with my mom. So it's it's doing those kind of things. Um, now, I do put a pitch in. Game shows are good. Jeopardy. If we we watch Jeopardy almost every night. And we talk. And it stimulates a lot of conversation. And that is a good thing. And I can see it, it, it forces all of us to kind of you know, pull from our past experience and learning and get those answers out. So it's not that television watching is bad, but something that's going to engage you is really important. Um, let's see. So we want to keep those mental processes going. You wanna read books and articles that challenge and inspire you. Even listening to books on, well, now I'm dating myself, books on tape. You can do audible or recorded books or you know, get a book, but keeping your brain going and completing puzzles and playing games. We've had a lot more game nights around here and, but that's really been good. And I don't think we've ever had a game night where we're like, we shouldn't have done that. We should have just watched something. And so it's good to engage and play those games. And there are games that you can play by yourself. You can do the cross, crosswords, Sudoku. My mom likes word searches. It just keeps your brain going. And as I mentioned before, learning new skills or hobbies is important. So whatever you used to enjoy, try it again. Start up, get, get a group to do it with you. But there's things that you can do to keep that going and engage in ongoing learning. There are so many free online classes now. Everywhere you turn, you can find a, a class about something you enjoy. Look at your library. Your library card is a wealth of free learning. And they have classes you can take that, you know, you can end up putting those classes, those skills on your resume. But there are so many um, classes going. Senior centers are offering classes. Senior Centers Without Walls is a program. AARP has classes. So there's a wealth out there of, of classes and activities that you can take that are at no charge. Social engagement, I can't say enough about this because this keeps people tuned in. We know that social engagement is associated with living longer with fewer disabilities. And if you think about, I know um, in my church, the older people are the busiest ones and it keeps people going and keeps them engaged. And in one of our talks that we did, Creating Dementia Friendly Churches, we talked about ways to even people who have dementia can still be engaged in different ways and still add and contribute to the church environment. But that can be in a club, any kind of organization can make modifications for someone who has dementia for that they can be involved as long as they physically can, as long as it's physically possible. But people who are socially engaged appear to have fewer disabilities. And staying engaged in a community offers you an opportunity to maintain your skills. Everybody has a skill to share. So you know what, if you were retired, you don't even have to be retired, but if you would like to volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association, we welcome everyone to the table. We need community educators who can share these talks. If you enjoy talking to groups, you would be a wonderful community educator. But we have other roles, w volunteer with WALK, organize an activity for the longest day, get, to, get a team together for WALK. There's so many ways, and, and that's just with us. But there is a need for volunteers out there, which is a wonderful way to keep your skills going and learn new skills. And remaining both socially and mentally active may support brain health and possibly delay the onset of dementia. I'll tell you what, the days that my mom, and I try to make sure she has a phone call every day, it, I can see it stimulates her memory and just it just creates a vibrancy to her than on the days we don't have a call. And I have to go back and also add some anecdotal notes about exercise. Exercising. If I can get my mom out for a walk, we have a better day. 
we have better conversation, just better, just better all behavior and adaptation to whatever the environment is, there is something to exercise for people with dementia and for, for those of us who are trying to minimize our risk for developing dementia. And so what can you do? Visit with friends and family. We may not be able to do it in person, but you know what? Zoom, Zoom meetings help. And, and I think we're all surprised at how we can still feel connected. And then also phone calls. Get your loved one on the phone and stay engaged. Even just socially having a telephone call really helps keep people engaged and keeps that brain stimulated. Because you, you have to think when you're talking. Engaging with others in your neighbors, your social circles, your community, and stay involved in your community. Don't, don't allow yourself to um, disconnect. And volunteering is so important. And joining a club or a group, find something that you enjoy that other people are doing it too. And, and we also talk about taking care of your, your health. You need to get moving. You need to exercise, eat right, keep your mind active and stay connected with others. Those are, that is the combination to achieve the maximum benefits. And by doing those four things, you can minimize your dementia risk. And the research is, is really starting to prove that. The studies that we're seeing even locally are, are leading to that um, conclusion that lifestyle can trump genetic risk. So do what you can to stay active, to eat well, stay engaged socially, and keep your brain stimulated. This is um, a gentleman, Dr. Tice, he's talking about some studies that were shown in the past. Those studies showed that the group that had was engaged in exercise regularly, eating healthy, staying socially connected, and finding stimulating activities, they had a lower risk of they had lower rates of dementia. So there are studies out there that show it. Consider participating in the Pointer study that is right here in Northern California. Look that up. Look up U.S. Pointer Study, P-O-I-N-T-E-R Study, and that's at UC Davis. And it's definitely worth looking at because that's it's looking at lifestyle and what intensity of lifestyle changes will make a difference. So I recommend that you start today. Start small and build it up. Don't, don't tackle a marathon unless you're already a runner. Just start by moving and getting going. Do something you enjoy and stick with it. Make healthy choices. Make a plan. Get yourself a support circle and have a good time. And know that if it's too good to be true, it probably isn't. Be cautious when you hear about huge promises or miracle cures. Do thorough resource research and trust reputable sources of information, your doctor, your pharmacist, the Alzheimer's Association, and here are the resources to the Alzheimer's Association. We went over them briefly in the other program, but ALZ.org is a wonderful resource for information and support. We have Alzheimer's Navigator, Community Resource Finder, ALZ Connected, Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiver Center, and the Safety Center and those are resources of support for people with dementia and their caregivers. Call the helpline. And if you have to call it information info line, you can call it whatever you want, but know that that is a resource of information out there for you. You can have a little question. You can have a medium-sized question or just wanna learn more about resources or what classes are happening, or you can register for a class through that number. And also, it's there if you're having a, a crisis or a behavioral um, event that's happening with your loved one. So utilize it for little stuff and utilize it for big stuff. If your family needs to be pulled together for a care consultation, 
start with that number and they'll help you assess where you are and get connected to the services that you need. Sign up for a support group. I had a wonderful experience um, here at the Alzheimer's Association. We have to shadow different um, services that we offer. And believe you me, when I went to the support group, it opened my eyes because I was thinking like, I, you know, I don't need to go to support. It was so helpful just to hear other people going through what you're going through. Because I think we all think that, oh, I'm the only person who could have this situation going on and you don't wanna talk about it. But when you hear other people sharing what's happening to them, it definitely makes you feel better. It's not that it makes you feel better because it's happening to them, but it lets you know that you are not alone. Take advantage of the education classes. This is one class we offer, Healthy Living for Brain and Body. I present this to employee resource groups, churches, clubs, sororities, fraternities. A lot of people want to know about what can we do to reduce our risk. Call us up. Call me up. I'll give you my number. It's in the chat, but it's 925-444-0474. And I can set up a presentation for you and your organization. There are training classes online at training.alz.org. Um, take advantage of, you can watch that. If you want someone you know to see this, you can go online and have them um, take a watch the video on trainingalz.org. But one thing we provide to our community is we will, we will meet you right now in Zoom, but we can do a presentation at one of your meetings or your, your club events but we are here to present community, um, community education. And we have community educators that will come, well, that will appear online and deliver important information to your organization. So I'm at the end of the presentation. I wanna thank you all for staying on today and learning about what you can do to reduce your risk. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll open it up if there, we have a little bit of time left for some questions. If there are any questions I can answer, please let me know. I'll look in the chat. Okay. Oh, you know what? Somebody asked me about those early signs of dementia. You memory that memory loss that impairs your daily life. It is not going upstairs, forgetting what you went upstairs for. It's not losing your keys. It's when you lose the ability to backtrack. It's so important. It's the backtracking. Like I came in the house. I know I had the groceries in my arm. I'm going to look along here. Let me check the table to see if I put the keys down. That's normal age-related memory loss. It's when you have no recollection. Um, I'm seeing that people are asking me to give my phone number. My work phone number is 92. Five, four, 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 zero, four, seven, four. I'm going to put it in the chat, and um, let's see. Here we go. Nine two five four 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 zero four seven four. You can set up a presentation for your organization. You can also email me at KD Fields. My kids say I type really slow and I do. <laughs> and wait a second, let me focus. At alz.org. So that is how you can reach me to, a, to arrange a presentation for your organization, your club, your group. We are here to spread information and knowledge and in all communities, but I particularly focus on the African-American community because we are at greater risk. And we do not want families to go to have go on this journey alone. It breaks my heart when in pre-pandemic days, I would hear from people when I was at a health fair, like, oh my gosh, I went through that with my mom. I didn't even know you guys existed. Well, that tells me we got more work to do. We got to get on our bullhorn and get that information out because we have got to shine a light on this so that when anybody is impacted, if it's not your family, you know where to tell a friend to go and find us. ALZ.org um, or our 1-800 number, 1-800-272-3900. Okay, I'll take another question. If there's any, 
And you know, some of those early warning signs are confusion about time and place, getting lost, going to familiar places. There can even be visual disturbances. And you know what, that's a safety concern, safety for driving, safety for higher risk of fall. So you wanna look at all of those. We have a presentation called the 10 warning signs where we can go in depth about those, but those are some of the more basic ones. Um, losing the ability to do some of the regular tasks that you were always doing like paying bills or handling business, that becomes challenging. You wanna to talk to your doctor about that. So there will be a link to this recording that we will send out to, um, to the registrants. And in a few days, we will post it on YouTube. But I wanna thank everyone for joining. And if you have more questions or need more information, my email is in the chat, feel free to reach out to me. And if your family needs support right now, call that 1-800 number. They are there to help you and get you connected so that your family can have a much better journey. Thank you everyone for joining today. And we hope to see you back in the future. Please share with the men in your life that they need to be here next Saturday for Black Men in Dementia. We have a wonderful panel lined up, Dr. Carl Hill. We have Dr. Robert Turner. We have one of our community um, representatives talking about his caregiving experience. And we have Reverend, Thorne Reverend Quasi Thornell will be leading as the moderator. It's going to be an excellent presentation to follow today's presentation. Thank you for joining us for Black Women and Dementia, Two Sides of the Story. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.